Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, Sean Bussey, Paul Downs, and Liz Picarazzi talk about their plans and goals for 2023. Sean, whose marketing efforts still haven't recovered from the pandemic, is hoping to build on the success of a recent event. Paul, coming off his best year ever, is investing $150,000 in a marketing campaign, including a new website targeting a different set of customers. And Liz, too, is attempting to shift her customer base, in her case, from residential to municipal work. More immediately, however, Liz, who does not relish dealing with legal issues, has to decide how to confront a copycat competitor. Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations will let owners know they are not alone in facing challenges. Same thing with our daily newsletter, the 21 Hats Morning Report, which Inc. Magazine recently named the best newsletter for business owners and which you can subscribe to for free at 21hats.com, where you can also find transcripts of our podcast episodes and lots of other articles and interviews. Joining me this week on the podcast are regulars Sean Bussey, CEO of Kinesis, which is based in Portland, Oregon, and works with small businesses on marketing, culture, and strategy. Paul Downs, who is CEO of Paul Downs Cabinet Makers, which is based outside of Philadelphia and makes custom conference tables. And Liz Picarazzi, who is CEO of CityBin, which is based in Brooklyn, New York, and makes trash enclosures and package bins. The episode is titled, I Want to Double Sales Again Next Year. Welcome, Sean, Paul, and Liz. It's great to have you here. It's now officially December, and there's no denying that 2022 is just about in the books. So I want to talk to you about your plans and goals for uh, 2023. I'm curious to what extent macro conditions are a factor in your thinking. I'm wondering if you're investing in growth, how much risk you see yourself taking, whether you're facing any tough budgeting decisions. Liz, can we start with you? Sure, absolutely. It's good that you asked the question about planning for 2023 because I'm not a very good planner. It's not something that I really enjoy doing. And I immediately thought of really two major areas that I see as goals. The first one is actual revenue, which is kind of the easiest to measure. I want to double revenue again next year. I think we could do more of that, more than that based on our current growth. But that's kind of officially what the goal is. And then the second area is to flesh out or to define and flesh out our municipal line. So this year, with all of the government work, we basically transformed our residential trash enclosure to be for municipal use and university use. We made a lot of really great changes. And therefore, it's a, it's a whole new product, really, that could be marketed, definitely priced a different way. And so I haven't really sat down and kind of worked on the messaging and the marketing and the, even the architecture of the website with this big kind of change in our customer base needs to be thought through. So for me, the second goal for 2023 is to really define this customer segment and really kind of develop marketing and different sales channels around it. In some ways, it, it feels a little bit like a new business. The target customer is different. Their needs are different and functions on the product are different. So that's, you know, for me, I'm a very creative person. I'm excited to do that. But up until now, it's really been just kind of flying by the seat of our pants with this product, product line, and I'm excited to formalize it. You said that you really don't like planning. How important do you think it is? If you don't like it, do you think you can just not do it? So I always do it and I often do it with my EO group. We kind of force ourselves to sit in a room for an entire day and to write it out. We sometimes do exercises to help bring out the answers to the planning. So I actually do enjoy doing that when it's a group, but when it's just on my own, I don't really like it. And I'm in a different EO group now, and I don't think that they do that planning. I need to to check on it. But when I do planning, I am not as focused at the numbers as I am about general areas that I want to be developed that sometimes don't have, you know, metrics. So moving, consolidating all of our operations 
into one space was a goal for 2022, and we are going to achieve it. That's very binary. Did we do it or not? So, you know, I say that I don't like it. I think it's just that I'm like a lot of entrepreneurs. I feel like I need to be inspired to sit down and do something like that. And that moment doesn't often come that way, at least not in like an eight hour time block. And, you know, even back when I was a student, I would always think, you know, to write this paper for this class, I need a you know, six hour block of time. And um, then that makes it really scary to start the task because you think it's six hours when it really could just be two. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I do approach planning in the same way I kind of did schoolwork in that it's kind of all or nothing. I either have the time to do it or I don't. Sean or Paul, how important do either of you think planning is and, and how seriously do you take it? I guess you would not call me a planner either in that I don't try to predict what will happen, but I always am monitoring it as the events occur and comparing them to past situations. So I don't do a budgeting process and then tell every person in my company, oh, you've got this much to spend or anything like that. Just don't think it really makes much difference in a company my size. We're going to probably get close to 5 million in revenues this year, 27 employees. So it's not a tiny company, but we're subject to what clients show up and what they want and whether it's big orders or small orders. So there's a lot of planning that you just can't, it's not really feasible to do. Now I am doing some marketing planning and I think that when it gets to be my turn to talk about next year, I can go into that. But I'm not huge on planning as if I can really map out a future. I just don't believe in it. How about you, Sean? I've kind of come full circle on this. You know, we for a long time would do annual planning. We would build a, you know, one page plan with dates throughout the year of achieving certain goals. And I think from a correlation standpoint, it seemed like that was effective for us when we were, you know, trying to go from you know, a business that was hundreds of thousands of dollars to a business that was over a million. You know, I think more recently, especially through the pandemic, the truth of a statement that I heard before the pandemic is just keeps ringing over and over and over again, which is that, you know, we live in volatile and uncertain times and that the moment you plan is really kind of your dumbest moment. So that's the time you have the least amount of insight and information and you're trying to you know, sort of control the future, which I think feels really, really good in lots of ways. But at the same time, you're giving Liz another excuse not to plan, Sean. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking the same thing. I think one of the things that has to be brought into the discussion is what resources are available to spend time on planning. I think that there's a lot of organizations that would listen to us and be like, well, that's why you're small. You don't plan. Well, there's a very sc- large school of thought out there that says, you know, you're not going to get where you want to go if you don't figure out where you're going. And you need to set goals for yourself and, you know, focus your energy in a certain direction. I'd say goals and planning are a little different. To finish this, this uh, narrative here, the switch we have made is more towards initiatives and more of a sprint or agile based way of working. So, you know, in the coming year, we know we want to achieve certain things or certain priorities that we think are important. So we'll set goals and objectives in the near term as to what we're going to do. Then we'll work on those, see the results, bring in the understanding and learning that came from that and then adjust. And I think that's really different than a sort of slavish plan, which is very common. You know, it's like lots of people had plans that they developed in January of 2020. And I promise you, none of those were relevant anymore. So that's an extreme example. Yeah, I'm not sure that's really an argument against planning, but uh, although you're certainly right. No, it's I, I'm, what I'm, ar- I'm not arguing against planning. I'm arguing towards a different way of planning. And actually, I think a way of planning Liz would like a lot better, which is more based in real time and more frequency of iteration and updates than are typical and that are common in the corporate world because the corporate world is trying to create a veil of certainty for their shareholders. Yeah, I I think that um, the way I plan is not necessarily like, here's what I expect to happen next June, but more being ready for situations. 
I've got two finishers. What happens if one of them is sick and can't show up? What happens if the truck breaks? What happens if this person disappears? What happens if we can't hire? Those things I have plans for. And for very common scenarios, like what happens if I need to hire another person, I have a very strict plan, which is just a set of procedures to implement. And then you, you end up with a new employee. So I think that for small businesses, turning situations into systems is actually the most effective way to plan. Hiring is a good example. If you're growing your company, you're going to hire people. However often you do it, it's a good idea to sort of have an understanding of what you're going to do when you need to do it. Do you have ads pre-written? Do you know which platform do you want to use? Do you have some way of keeping track of all the applicants? Do you have a way of scoring the applicants to decide who you want to talk to more? Those are things that I spend a lot of time doing, which is building out little solutions, systemic solutions for common problems. And I don't know whether that's exactly planning or some other word to call it, but that's, that's what I think of as planning, which is build capability that's ready for the most likely the scenarios. And then also build internal communications with the company and culture so that when something really out of the left field, like a pandemic or whatever, you have a culture that can respond to it. People are ready to respond, to hear direction, to provide input. That's, the, I think, the most effective planning for a small business. It's really difficult to say, oh, we're going to grow 10% next year, and that means 2.5% each quarter, and here are the numbers. <laughs> and, you know, like that stuff just doesn't really make much sense to me. No. But the, the other kind of planning, I think, is pretty critical. Liz just said that she hopes to double next year. But she didn't tell us from what to what. Liz? Well, I'm not going to share that exactly, but... Maybe I will. Well, I mean, if it's from a dollar to two dollars, it shouldn't be much of a trick. Right. Well, I, I will share. I will be transparent. Yeah, like why wouldn't you tell? We would be going from two to four million. I mean, that's not going to be super simple, except your manufacturing happens somewhere else. So at least you don't have to build it all. That's the your 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 sources problem. Yeah. You gotta finance it. That's probably the biggest this problem. This is such a good illustration of most people conflate planning and strategy. And most people actually miss the strategy entirely. Like what Liz is talking about is actually strategy. She's saying, I'm going to augment my strategy. I'm going to add to my strategy. I'm going to go into new, I'm going to a new playing field. That's a strategic move of which there is great uncertainty and, you know, it could fail, right? That's a good illustration of strategy. There's a lack of certainty. There's a lack of clarity of where we need to go and what we need to do, but there's a theory of the case. And what a lot of organizations do is they do planning, which is kind of what Paul was describing, which is like contingencies or improvements to ecosystems or capital investments. And that's fine. You know, like that's legit and real and should be done. But then they combine the word strategy with that and they say, we're going to do strategic planning. And actually what they're doing is just more operational changes and, and just plan. It's just planning. Right. And most organizations actually don't even do strategy. Whereas like both the other folks on this call, either today, like Liz described, or as Paul said in the past of like, you know, kind of shifting a lot of his way of working and moving into the, you know, kind of more of the B2B or B2G space. Like some of the things he's described have been strategy oriented. And so I think when you ask the question, Lauren, what are you doing for planning? I think it's really important that the listeners here get the difference between the two. It may be more important to do strategy at any given moment, or it may be more important to button up your, your operations at any given moment. There's a lot of, of variation in smaller businesses as to what the owner is best at and capable of. And my observation over the years has been that I got a lot more value out of addressing things I was bad at than continuing to do more of what I was good at. And so... I think it's a question of like, what are you leaving undone? If you're like me, you, you're great at sort of operationalizing. It's harder to get strategic. Mm -hmm. And sounds like Liz is easier to be strategic and harder to be operational. Yep. Yeah. I mean, who are you? Where are you? Right. Well, and it also involves choices. So you've heard me talking on here about bears and the bear-proof trash enclosure expansion to the West Coast. That was incredibly 
exciting project for me, but I had to make the decision to put down the bear and focus on the rats. (laughs) (laughs) I really had to embrace those rats and now I don't have time for the bears. And I hate that because last February when we were doing our installations in Aspen and it looked like the sky was the limit for you know, that need in, in Aspen, Colorado, like I just don't have time for it. And I know that it's in our future. We've probably are 75% of the way there, but part of the strategy is saying, what am I going to stop doing? You know, I'm going to be focusing less on package lockers also, which bums me out, but we just, you know, we've got this growth with trash enclosures. We've got a lot of high profile jobs. There's going to be more press. My focus has to be on New York City trash and rats. Yeah, that's another great illustration of a strategy. It it involves trade-offs. It it involves doing something and not something else. You know, it's a great illustration, Liz, of, you know, that tension of, gosh, I got to put this thing down because this other thing is really the thing. And that's another good illustration of why I think iterative working is a superior way, right? If you had started the year out and said, we are going to make this the year of, of bear enclosures, and you just worked at that, I worked at that, I worked at that, I worked at that, and didn't pay attention to the inputs that you were getting from, you know, New York City and like the press, you would have been on a like kind of fool's errand out in Denver, right? And instead of the kind of growth you've experienced, I think it's just such a good illustration of the difference between planning and a strategy and iteration. But you have set the goal of doubling your revenue, Liz. What does have to happen for you to do that in terms of marketing, manufacturing, financing? What what are you concerned about there? We just need to get more cities. So (laughs) we got Philly this week. We are talking to Boston. We recently got Hoboken. And these are pilots. It's not like a rollout. But if I look at all the municipalities that have issues with trash on the sidewalk, it's virtually every city. So I have a very big market and I just need to find the The ones. The sky is still the limit. It is still the limit with the trash enclosures. So, you know, to grow production too. I mean, I do have a very good relationship with my factory. I have been with them for five years. They give me very good trade terms. If we had a PO from a city, I think that I would be able to finance it that way. I mean, I definitely need to look into it, but they welcome the growth. They've been a very accommodating of the growth. And um, I guess I also should think about diversifying. So, you know, we had thought a bit about Mexico, did a little bit of poking around. Diversifying buying your manufacturing. Manufacturing, yeah. That's definitely on the back burner because I spent so much time trying to reshore production last year. I put that to the side and said, let's just focus on the factory that's working well for us. And, um, you know, so we'll see if they can handle production. That's where I would want it to be. Paul, how about you? You you mentioned your marketing plans for next year. This is a project that's really been going on for about nine months now. And it is producing materials and messaging aimed at a very particular target market for me, which is architects and interior designers, as opposed to the way we get most of our business now is mostly through people doing Google searches, which is just a grab bag of everybody you can imagine. The architects and interior designers have a particular set of concerns and a particular set of likes and dislikes about the product and how the transactions go. It's it's a subset of the kind of work that we do now, but I think that there's huge potential for growth. So I've been putting together what we need to go talk to them. And we're about two thirds of the way through putting together branding film and, and uh, we've done market research and now we're just starting to put up a new website that's aimed only at these buyers. And I hope to have all that done by, let's say, the end of February and up and running. And then we're going to roll out the advertising and see how it goes. So that's a strategic shift in trying to get to buyers who are buying our product, but doing it in a way that's different than what we normally do. And it's going to cost me, I don't know, 150 grand over the next year. And it's a roll of the dice. So the planning part is just the execution of what I can control. And the unplanned part is what will happen. (laughs) 
So that's why I'm, I, I hesitate to say, oh, yeah, I know what my ROI is going to be on that. I just don't. You don't know. Yeah. I, I have hopes, but I don't know. Hey, Paul, I'm kind of curious, like, did this meet exceed or disappoint you in terms of your expectations about the timeline of kind of building out this new ecosystem and, you know, really being like ready to go? It sounds like it's going to take about a year all, all in before you're like really kind of ready to go. Yeah. Is that, is that reasonable? That's, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. No. Okay. So that was sort of your expectation. That's about as fast as I could have moved anyway, given that I like to be involved in a lot of the content that we put out. I have my standards as a writer and for photography. So it's never going to be a situation where I just write a check and hand it off to somebody. I'm always very involved in these things. And I'm not sure on the actual constraint, but it's moving at a speed that I'm comfortable with. Not too fast, not too slow. Yeah. Can I just replay that little piece of conversation for like every client I ever meet? Because, you know, universally, everybody wants it done in six months. And I'm like, you need a year. You know, to really like shift markets, to go after new customers, to do it all right. So I appreciate you sharing that. Did you learn anything along the way? Yeah, absolutely. The first thing we did with this marketing company we engaged was have them go out and, you know, do some market research, talk to people who are the target and ask them a bunch of questions that we didn't know the answer to. And that took a while for them to round up people who are willing to sit down for an hour or so. What kinds of questions? What do you worry about? We sell a custom product and we're very familiar with what that means, but we weren't sure how the target market thinks about that purchase. What do they default to? What are they afraid of if they go custom? Who do they like to work with? What's the advantage of being local as opposed to not local? And there were a bunch of things like that that we had suspicions about, but I didn't actually know that by talking to people. I just had suspicions. So doing the market research, interviewing people, reading the transcripts, listening to the interviews. In one case, I did follow-ups with one of the people. It was just very informative. It really clarified in our minds the difference between this buying audience and our average customer, which is, it's just a different situation. And most of our current marketing and procedures, all kinds of things that we do are a great fit for someone who's just searching for a table, but a bad fit for someone who's a professional who does this over and over again. Because we turned up a concern that the custom maker doesn't really pay any attention to what the architect wants to accomplish in the entire project. In other words, architects have a design vision for how things look and work. And we've developed our business to do all the designing for people who don't have any help available. And architects, as it turns out, are extremely sensitive to the idea that someone's going to come in and be like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Give me, you, know, <laughs> you get out of the room now and I'm going to build whatever I feel like with this customer. So we got to dial back a lot of what we say and how we say it. And so in the course of that came to the conclusion that the website that we currently have, which is aimed at an untutored buyer, it was just offensive to an architect and designer. There's a lot on it that's just like absolutely wrong that uh, calls forth a cringe factor from architects. And we just can't make that work for two audiences. So you just got to come up with a second website. That was something that turned up in the middle of the summer. And now I've finally engaged a firm and blah, 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 blah. But I'm very methodical about these things. And I'm always willing to believe there's more that I don't know than I do know. And so I'm just feeling my way through it. Paul, how many folks did you guys talk to, you know, to get a start to see a pattern? You know, was it three, 12, 100? We we talked to, I think, 14 people. And that was a budgetary constraint. The initial proposal from the marketing company was to do a small amount of this. And I can't remember the exact number. And I looked at that and I said, hey, triple that. I want more. You wanted more. Oh, interesting. I want more input at the very beginning because what I was worried about is if you only talk to one person and you're trying to choose them out of the phone book, more or less, so it's not someone we know, 
like if you run into a nutcase, you're going to be you're going to be <laughs> operating on on bad information. And I that's one thing I do know from my experience just receiving Google searches that there's enormous variation in who's on the other end of a phone mm-hmm. on any given day in any given situation. So I wanted more there. I paid more for it, and it took more time. But I'm glad I did that. Yeah, you didn't do any kind of. Um like large scale market research, like total size of market or anything. No, I, don't care, but I don't care much about that because the total size of the market, first of all, all the market research on office furniture is now worthless because COVID <laughs> is right. like nobody really knows how this is going to play out. I have my suspicions that the large companies are going to suffer a lot because they built their capabilities, their capacity, their factories, number of employees, all around a certain level of purchasing that was pre-pandemic. And, you know, the post-pandemic office furniture world is clearly not going to be as big as the Mm pre-pandemic. The total size of the market compared to what I'm capable of doing is thousands of times bigger than what we could do. So I don't really care what, what the overall size is. I'm more thinking about, okay, What's what's more likely that someone's going to, if they're going to be spending money on this thing, are they going to want just a catalog piece or are they going to want something special? And I see a big opportunity for us, but that's my fantasy planning. You know, it could play out anyway. I don't really know exactly what will happen. Do you have any concerns about being able to meet the demand if this campaign is successful and you do have a whole bunch of new clients? That's like my favorite concern. <laughs> <laughs> Are you planning for it? <laughs> I've, I've been, yeah. I mean, we actually experienced 25% growth this year. And so I've, uh, I've now rented new space, bought new equipment, hired new people. And I'm ready for to maintain this new level or even to go farther. But that's the goal. So, yeah, I've been, I've been sort of getting ready to do that. How about you, Sean? You you had told us that you had an event scheduled for November that you call Catalyst that you were hoping would kind of get your marketing back on track. Was that helpful? And is that influencing your thoughts about what might be possible next year? Yeah. I mean, for anybody who's ever held an event, they know that the returns on events don't happen <laughs> right away. You know, I mean, you're talking um, goodwill reputation, brand, you know, these are the kind of things where, you know, there's probably a dozen people in that room who probably can't even buy services from us, but are in a position to recommend us to other people. And those kind of conversations, you can't predict when they're going to happen. So, you know, our strategy there is have a room full of influencers, some potential clients, um, some actual clients, and then just great people put them all together, have a really fantastic event. Don't sell to them. Um, We were really cognizant of not selling to people. And position Kinesis as a hub of the owner-operated business, as the hub of businesses that care about culture and people, as a company who's connected to really great businesses and organizations and leaders. And it was awesome. I mean, just... Well, I'll let Liz talk about it because she was a speaker and a participant. So she can be the, you know, kind of what was it like to be there, not having expectations. Tell us the real story, Liz. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, one thing I can say is that at no point did I detect any selling. In fact, only through talking about it now did I realize that that may have been part of your intent. Like it was definitely really focused more on the program and the content. And that was definitely maybe very... um, kind of understated. Yes. Um, I just was really noticing that Sean has a lot of clients that have been with him for a long time and has a, a, definitely very great references. And there's just a certain vibe or culture around the people that were at that event. Um, and I really liked it. it. It definitely did not feel New York. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way for either New York or Portland, yeah, yeah, but there yeah. was definitely you know a different feel to it. I guess I've said it before on here, I think that any time that entrepreneurs can be in a room together is valuable. So I really like to be able to feel that like on the other side of the country. And I also think that those events are great for content too. So Sean, like you say, sometimes the dividends from those events don't 
happen until later. And it could be once you slice and dice the content that you got, then you push that out and then that's going to bring people in. So the event itself is a very good strategy and I thought it was really well executed and I met a lot of really great people. You know, also a lot of family owned businesses, which I relate to. Yeah, there were a lot of, there were a lot of couples there. Yeah. I mean, Liz was one of our speakers. You know, we had this kind of rapid fire, almost like a mini TED talk where, how much time did you have, Liz? We only gave you like five minutes or eight yeah. minutes. It was really short. And so we had these like se- series of entrepreneurs talking about an idea. There were folks who talked about, you know, the idea of, you know, really transforming your culture. There were folks who talked about upside thinking. So the idea of like taking big risks and, and what's a strategy for taking a big risk that won't destroy your company. So it's like the idea, you know, is how do we create a learning environment? How do you create a space where owners and entrepreneurs can really learn and grow from each other, have out, you know, kind of breakout groups um, and make it highly participatory as opposed to the typical conference where people kind of talk at you. We wanted less of the talking at you. Was COVID a factor at all? I mean, I hear people saying, you know, it, it, it's over. And if you th- throw something, people will come. Flights are full. Was that a concern at all? You know, COVID was a problem in a very, in a way you wouldn't think of, which was when you do an event, you need to plan that almost even a year out, right? And the problem is, if you think back to like a year ago or, or so when we were planning, it was like right after Omicron. And everybody was having this moment of like, oh, shit. And so we were like, wait, how are we going to have an event? Are we going to have the next version of Omicron? Are we going to have a Delta that was actually deadly? You know, so planning an event with the uncertainty of COVID was really difficult. And the problem with that became we kept having to put off key decisions until way too late in the game. And so that's where COVID became a real problem is the uncertainty of what it would be doing in the fall. So that was problem one. And so to mitigate that to some degree, we we had to choose spaces that were really large and had things like large garage doors, really good ventilation, big open spaces where people could be apart from each other if they wanted to be. So that meant, you know, you spend more money, right? A bigger space, more money nicer spaces in some ways, you know, that have great ventilation. We had dinner the night before. So we had to have that at a space that was very open and not a sit down dinner, a stand up dinner so that, you know, people could distance if they wanted to or wear masks if they wanted to. So it just totally changed a lot of decision making. But, you know, at the end of the day, we felt pretty good about it because there were people there that, you know, had family members that were immunocompromised. And so they wore masks the whole time but the vast majority didn't. And so we wanted to make it comfortable if you were cautious. And yeah, that's that worked out okay, but it made planning way harder. So where does this leave you in terms of thinking about next year? Oh, we're going to do it again for sure. We're today trying to finalize the date. It'll be in September next year. And that's the other thing is we had it in November which is risky with weather in Oregon. Um, we, got, we got really lucky. It didn't rain or snow, but next year we'll do it in September. All right. Last topic today. Uh, Liz, I gather you've discovered you have a new competitor. Can you tell us about that? Well, I wouldn't call it a competitor. I would call it a copycat. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I have been kind of on a roller coaster with this. I'm feeling better about it. But I'll, I'll tell you what happened. A couple of weeks ago, I saw on Instagram in a story of someone who's kind of a distant sort of business colleague with a logo that was for a company that I knew he was starting that was for garbage enclosures. And I thought, okay, I know he was coming up with this. Let me see what it is. So I go into the website and I see that the design of the product is identical to Citibin in terms of first off, it's modularity. So we do modules that can be put together. So if you have six trash cans, you get six modules. The actual shape of it Individual parts of that bin are exactly identical to city bin. The color is the same, 
And as if that wasn't already bad enough, when I went to then their website, I saw that some of the copy was the same as ours. The imagery was derived from ours, like when we talk about functionality. And as if that wasn't bad enough, then I went to their Instagram and I saw that they were following most of Citibin's followers, including my 16-year-old daughter and distant cousins of some of my Venezuelan employees in Venezuela. Like there's zero reason for this company to follow those people if they weren't going after Citibin's followers. So, you know, this definitely was very confronting. Um, When it first came up, it was actually right before I went to Portland. So I probably talked Sean's ear off about it. (laughs) She was fired up. (laughs) I was very fired up. I had just found out. And, you know, so I needed to shop again for intellectual property attorneys. I had done it around a year ago and just sort of dropped it partly because of my very irrational dislike of legal work. But this time I really needed to find one that was going to help move me ahead on this because this is the scream season desist. You know, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to that letter to be drafted. I did hire one of the companies uh, or one of the firms. It's an IP lawyer that's helped one of my good business friends and I really trust her judgment. And she also knows me really well. So she knows stylistically, you know, who would I want to work with? And I said, you know, I'm kind of up and down with it. The reason I've been up lately is that, you know, in inspecting their website further, it really does look like they just, they're they're priced only 5% below us and they have far less functionality. You know, they haven't been in market for 10 years like us. They don't have, you know, hundreds of customer testimonials. So if I was a consumer trying to decide between that company and a city bin, I would say, why in the world would I pay, you know, 5% less to get so much less than Citibin offers? And then the second part I've been thinking a lot about, and it may be kind of arrogant, but I can be that way sometimes, is this guy is a total idiot for not coming up with a product that was in its own part of the market. So if I were him, I would have made a trash enclosure that was in between a Rubbermaid shed and a Citibin with Citibin being like the luxury one. So as a business person, I'm actually a little disappointed in him. <laughs> Are you giving him advice here, Liz? <laughs> yeah. His strategy is terrible. <laughs> it's a horrible strategy. And because it's a horrible strategy, it can play out for us in ways that two weeks ago when I was complaining to Sean, I didn't anticipate. And just one illustration, we had a potential customer this week um, with a price objection, as we call it. And so we always send a follow up that says, you know, these are some of the other options you might consider. Like, we really just want you to have a trash enclosure, even if it isn't ours. And so Frank, instead of, you know, putting the usual things in there as the links, he put this company and it was you might want to check them out because we know, A, that it's only cost 5% less and they'll realize, well, why would we get this if we could get the real thing? And secondly, we don't think that company is going to be able to fulfill. So if that customer ordered $10,000 worth of product, this guy does not have a warehouse full of city bins like we do. What he has is a prototype in front of his house that he took some pictures with, with his daughter, which is another thing in my marketing. I use my family in marketing a lot. So he had his daughter doing a demo. So that's really what happened. I know I'm kind of going on and on, but A few years ago in 2017, we had another copycat and we were able to get through a cease and desist, a licensing fee from it. And so that's good for the patent attorney because there is a record of Citibin licensing its product to another company. And that's a precedent I don't think I understood at the time was as important as it is. I do have a patent. I do have a trademark. We'll see how well they protect me. But the other thing I've got some concern about is that I don't like spending my time on this. You know, I don't like spending my time or my money on legal stuff. So there's this kind of resentment that comes up that um, is hard for me to shed. Like, I feel like I'm kind of grumpy about like this guy that did this is like robbing me of the things I want to be working on. 
and that's just dumb. We're human beings. These things happen. But I have this resentment against him is because he's taking my attention away from things that I want to be focused on. Liz, do you have a sense at this point if or where he has crossed the legal line? I mean, copycat products have existed since there have been products. There are certain things that clearly one can do. Do you know what lines he may have crossed? I don't yet. I think that there's a lot of evidence of intent, which, you know, my lawyer said that even though that legally can't necessarily be used, in a cease and desist, it can be mentioned. So the copying of the website, you know, that's a copyright infringement. You know, the trade dress is something where, you know, if you're driving by and you see something that looks like a city bin, but then upon closer inspection, it's not. That is a trade dress violation because you're making something that may have very poor craftsmanship that people will think is a city bin. And that's what happened a few years ago is that a condo owner made these trash enclosures using the exact same materials as ours, exact same materials. But when you looked at like the aluminum edges, you could see it was all jagged. So like if someone got scratched on it, for example, that could be viewed as someone could think, oh, that's a city bin. So we'll see. I mean, I, I could see it coming back as you don't have a leg to stand on. And um, I don't know what I'm going to do about that. I think that if you're still married, you should stop Frank from uh, sending people to this company because that seems to me like an enormous mistake. Why? Well, first of all, I've, we run into versions of this because I make something that a lot of people can make. I've, I personally just try to ignore the uh, opposition or the competitor. But if you said, hey, here's a company that we recommend you take a look at, it kind of undercuts any legal argument you might make that these people are, are infringing. Like, why in the world, if they're infringing, would you send your customer to them? And I, I don't know whether the lawyer heard about this yet, but I can't imagine they wouldn't say, don't do that again. That, that strikes me as just being really counterproductive. Liz has the momentum, the marketing acumen. The, the the she is the story right now, and the last thing you want is the story to switch from our champion against rats, the person who's in you know uh, Times Square to legal battle. And when I look at like Me Too competitors coming in, it almost always is determined by how good of marketers they are. You know, oftentimes the Me Too wins because they're better marketers than the original innovator. If you think about like Steve Jobs and Apple, much of their ideas and technology, they copied off of other people. They were just way better marketers. And I think you have the inverse situation where you have probably somebody who's a shitty marketer who's trying to mimic and copy you, but they're actually not very good at marketing. I don't know that you want to give them fuel. To some extent, you can give them fuel by suing them. That becomes their marketing. No, I, I think that, that at this point, right now, before this guy's got any traction at all, firing a shot across his bow is probably worth doing. Sure. You got a lawyer. Lawyer writes a letter. I mean, the lawyer will tell you whether you have any, a leg to stand on. And if, the, if you do, go ahead, take one shot and then ignore them. Just yeah. strengthen your own game. Like we know that all of our clients have other choices in the market. Mm -hmm. They can always buy something cheaper. They could always get something faster. And like, yeah, I don't care. Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to make every minute of interacting with me so wonderful. You're not even tempted to look anywhere else. And if you do, you're going to be comparing the experience you're getting from Paul Downs with whatever you're getting from somebody else. And I guarantee you, it won't be as good as experience. So I let the other people worry about them. I worry about me and making sure that my game is strong. Yeah. The other thing too, is if you think about your price strategy, you're playing the, the premium game, Liz, right? Yes. And so the premium game, it gives you the most important thing in the world, which is margin. And margin then gives you the opportunity to do better marketing, to do more promotion, to do all the things that get your product in an upward spiral of awareness. If he does what you say and like, you know, 
first of all, he's playing the failed game of like slightly cheaper. But if he goes to that middle point, now you know like what his margin is going to be on this thing, right? It's not going to be awesome. And so he's not going to have resources to do the kind of stuff you're doing. So he's always going to lose. I mean, he's he's sort of behind already in terms of playing the Me Too game. I, I just, I don't see you spending a lot of energy on this being very helpful past, I think what Paul's saying, you know, threaten him, see if the threat does something, but then don't take it further than that because you get it into the public sphere. Now you're like the story and like, that's not a good story. No, not at all. I mean, you could keep an eye on his Google reviews to see how it's going. If he's starting to rack up hundreds of great reviews, then then you've got a competitor. Mm -hmm. If there's no there's no reviews or they're bad reviews, don't even worry about it. There's people who can make tables. And I don't give a damn. You know, they they they're not me. I can't control what they do, but I can make what I do excellent, and that's my strategy. Liz, do you have a sense that he's gotten any traction at all? No. I don't. I think it's a prototype. He had one of them made and he took some photos of it. So on their Instagram, uh, there are, actually it's all renderings. There aren't any real photos. Yeah, that's what struck me too as a, as a potential buyer. I was looking at their account. And I'm like, these aren't even real. This is total vaporware. Your problem isn't as big as you think. You're going you're gonna to spend five grand on a lawyer. They're going to do what they do and then forget about it. Play, play your own game. Is that what the lawyer said to you, Liz? Well, they want their fees. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I mean, I interviewed four before I decided on the one. And one of them that I didn't hire, and this wasn't the reason, said that I wouldn't have basically a leg, a leg to stand on. And um, these really, it's actually two people that are working together on it. Um, Things that the, that the letter is a very good start but said that in terms of my IP security, I should be focusing on new patents rather than enforcing past past ones. And I think that is because some of the municipal work that we're doing is going to be patentable. I would like to focus my budget more on that than on the residential product that, you know, this guy obviously has been looking at closely over the years and is now trying to copycat. The difference between the two products being that the municipal work has to be stronger and tougher. Yep. Better hardware, better locks, latches. I think you also are leaving out an important point. Like the guy who's copying you, what's his background? So he's actually a property manager, a fairly large one in Brooklyn. And he also like renovates and flips homes. You know, my biggest target is property managers. They're probably close to 50% of our business. So I do have a little bit of a fear that he's going to have connections in that property management world. But I also know that everybody in the property management world in New York knows who Citibin is because we've been marketing to them. So, you know, hopefully they'll look at him and be like, what is this shoddy copy of a Citibin? <laughs> yeah. And people who flip houses, in my experience, tend to be corner cutters. Um you know, I, I just don't see somebody with that background being a phenomenal marketing and branding person. Right. Well, he doesn't. He has three other companies. And if you look at their websites or their Instagrams, they're not very good. So that's definitely not his strong suit. Well, he's also not a manufacturer. Do you know how he plans to make the things? That I don't know either. <laughs> um, we are definitely on the lookout. Really, everybody on the team, we're all pretty furious about this or maybe a little bit amused at this point. It's a compliment. Yeah. It, it could be a compliment. And we, I'm not going to say the fellow's name, but he looks like the actor Bob Balaban. So we refer to him as Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it is Bob Balaban. All right. Well, we will certainly be eager to hear more about that as the situation evolves, Liz. My thanks to Sean Bussey, Paul Downs, and Liz Picarazzi. It's been great talking to you all year, and I'm excited to see what you guys do in 2023. Wait, wait, don't leave yet. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like the 21 Hats owners to address, send it to me by replying to your morning report or by email at lauren at 21hats.com. That's L-O-R-E-N at 21hats.com. Do it now before you forget. And don't be afraid to tell Jay what you really think. He can take it. And if you got something out of this conversation, help us reach more business owners. Tell a friend, subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. 
follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to The Morning Report at 21hats.com. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Okay, now you can leave. Thanks for listening, everyone.